In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So if I were being totally honest, I would confess that things have been getting under my skin more and more uh, recently, more than normal. Global and national news have been weighing heavily on me, and as I discussed last Sunday, local news as well. And as more details emerge around last week's tragedy in Midland, the brokenness of it all becomes more profound. How do we deal with all of this? And now, now we're heading into that penitential season of Lent. What's going to lift us up and carry us through? And you know, I have a bad habit. I kind of live between goalposts. I think to myself, if I can get through this week, then I'll have a break. Or if I can get through this week, I'm really excited about this that's happening on, on Saturday. Or uh, if I can get through this month, uh, then I have a reprieve or uh, something to look forward to. Or at the end of this season, I'll be able to go on a, a vacation to renew. Uh, but something is always on the horizon helping to carry me through the current season uh, in time, just beyond the horizon a finish line, a destination, something to generate a little bit of excitement or a reset. And I did it with that trip to the Galapagos I talked about last week, which I described as absolutely amazing, rejuvenating, filled with sun, family, nature, adventure, a different culture, everything I could have asked. But I went into it thinking that once I got on that plane, this tension <coughs> this heaviness on my shoulders would disappear. If I can just get one week basking in the sun, it will get me much closer to spring. We're only a week away from daylight savings. And it hasn't even been that harsh a winter. But you know what? That line of thinking is flawed. Yes, rejuvenation is critical. Time with family and time away is life-giving. Communing with nature and engaging different people is sustaining to my faith and my appreciation of the breadth of God's creation. But it doesn't make it any easier to read the headlines or to be kinder and more understanding when I'm stressed and frustrated. And it doesn't make the recent cold snap any warmer. As I was preparing for today, I read several sermons reflecting on the story that we just heard, sermons about people's own individual mountaintop experiences, about moments where they knew God had to be at hand, whether it actually was literally on a mountaintop looking over a beautiful vista, uh, or whether it was a metaphorical mountaintop, the, uh, the holding of that firstborn new child uh, and being absolutely convinced that only God could make this possible. Whatever it is, the theme was that those moments, those mountaintop moments, sustain us when we go about the humdrum everyday life that we live. Or that we are on that mountaintop uh, experience today because as we head into Lent, into the wilderness, uh, we need something to sustain us through Lent until we get to the other side of Holy Week to Easter. Sort of like we're a matchbox car that you drop from high enough uh, that it will get down and then be able to, uh, to continue and go up the other side. And you know what? I've preached similar sermons to that before, but it didn't resonate this year with me the same. What really struck me was coming across a quote by former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, sort of the closest thing we have to a, a mystic theologian uh, in our tradition, who wrote that the hardest thing in the world the hardest thing in the world is to be where you are. And it's so true. Not to be looking forward or backwards, but to be where you are. That really resonated. And as I read the story again, I realized that it wasn't about finding God on top of a mountain uh, uh, for refreshment, to be sustained. Uh, it wasn't a retreat as much as Peter wanted it to be. Uh, Lord, can we just set up a few tents and stay here a while? Uh, you know, make this a five-day retreat. Uh, you know, we can meditate. We can do all kinds of things. No. It was about context, 
for a life lived on the ground. It was about how we look at all the things that had come before and all the things that would come after and understand that God was in the midst of them. Uh, from the, the law handed to Moses uh, through Elijah, who is God's messenger throughout time, to the ministry of Jesus, that we would understand God's hand, and God's investment, God's care in every aspect of life, and that we would understand that God was in the midst of this most difficult journey that lied ahead. This was about sustaining us on the ground. Well, which is why the story goes quickly from that mountaintop straight into uh, the folks in desperate need of healing and the disciples couldn't figure out what to do uh, and the chaos of life was right upon them the second they got down the mountain. But that's where we live and it is about finding light and sustenance in that, in those moments, in the life that we live. It was also a moment for light bulbs to go off. When they were up there, they were supposed to have epiphany after epiphany. They were supposed to have all of uh, what they had witnessed. This thing that caused them to drop their nets and to leave their way of life make sense in a new way. That they were part of God's un, uh, uh, unraveling plan, opening plan. Uh, that they were part of something uh, that was beyond themselves. And the light bulb from the three wise men coming and that we celebrate at the beginning of Epiphany uh, to Jesus' baptism where they hear those familiar words uh, that they heard there uh, on, on the mountaintop again. Uh, to uh, that first miracle at a wedding of Cana, to their very calling to drop their nets and follow them and be fishers of people. All of those are wrapped into the light bulbs in this moment as Jesus is transfigured and they hear God's voice. And God's voice says, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, uh, echoing that baptism. But then it goes one line further further. Listen to him. God's voice says, listen to him. And hopefully, like a saccade of, uh, of, of images, all of those words of Jesus came rushing into their head. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Love one another as I have loved you. Step even further than that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Take another big step beyond that. Love your enemy. So who's our neighbor? Who is a neighbor to that man beaten and near death on the side of the road? Yes, yes, it was the Samaritan who helped him, who cleaned his wounds, who took him to shelter, who paid for his care. Be that kind of neighbor. Lord, why do you dine with sinners? Because I came to show the breath of God's love. And the father, sprinting to meet his wayward son, throwing his arms around him, putting a ring on his finger, saying, we must celebrate that you who were lost has been found. That is the kind of love that God has for each and every one of us. Light bulbs going off, the words of Jesus resonating. Listen to him. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the people the world has trampled down. Blessed are the people you have looked past. Blessed are the people you've disregarded. And you, you, however you see yourself, however broken you know yourself to be, you are the light of the world. Truly, Whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Whether it was visiting the imprisoned, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, giving love to the seeming unlovable, you did it to me. And the mountaintop was a moment to see the heartbreaking events with God in the midst of them as part of the divine story. Death and resurrection is not apart from God. God is in the midst of it. The mountaintop isn't what sustains us so that we can go down. It is what uh, reminds us that the light of God, that that transforming light is all around us. 
is in the wholeness of life. We can't escape it. I'm reminded of Thomas Merton, uh, a wonderful monk and saint amongst us, his revelation that he had in a very common uh, downtown Louisville corner that isn't all that spectacular, and it certainly isn't a mountaintop experience, uh, but in that street corner where uh, business people are walking in suits and the homeless are pushing all of their possessions and shopping carts taken from the nearby Kroger, he has this epiphany. And he says this, in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with a realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I was theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. This sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. I have the immense joy of being man, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate, as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me. Now I realize what we all are. And if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. You know, when I was early in my ministry, people would always say something along these lines. If I didn't know Easter was coming, I couldn't get through Lent, and I certainly couldn't get through the events of Holy Week. I couldn't get through Good Friday if I didn't know Easter was just around the corner. But the longer I do this, the more that I see it in reverse. I can't trust Easter. I can't imagine getting to Easter and knowing that that truth holds if I didn't see God in Good Friday if I didn't see the love of God poured out in the cross, if I didn't see God when the skies turned black, if I didn't see God holding hands around a hospital bed at the end of life, I couldn't trust Easter. And it isn't trips to the Galapagos that remind me that God is here. It isn't mountaintop experiences that remind me uh, that all of you are on fire with the light of God. It's what we do week in and week out. We come together, we break bread, and sometimes when we put our hands out, we feel it. And sometimes we don't, but we still do it. Sometimes the word of God smacks us across the head, and other times we're busy thinking about our shopping list, but we come together. And in that recalibration, in that commitment to hope, our lives are changed, and we become more capable of seeing that light. So I invite you not to sustain yourself before Tuesday so that you might be able to cruise into Holy Week still holding on and get to the other side at Easter, but that you see this time in the wilderness, this time in between in the valley as an opportunity to see the light in each one of us, to see God's hand at work. To see God not just in the events of Holy Week, not just in the triumph of Easter, not just on this day, but in all your interactions. That you may have to keep from laughing at the realization that we are all walking around shining like the sun. Amen.